Three, two, one. Welcome to the Coat Closet. I'm one of your hosts, Landon Roberts. And I'm one of your other hosts, Christian Robinson. We finally figured it out. Host oh. and other host. I mean, that's what a co-host means, technically. If we, we boil co-host down to its root words. Yeah, it's the cooperating co- <laughs> host. The co-host. That's fair. There's never been a lead host, bro. I feel like we should be... There is only Venom. (laughs) Yeah, that's who we are. (laughs) Who's Venom and who's Eddie Brock? We all know the true answer. Venom. I'm Carnage. I'm Eminem rapping Venom. (laughs) (laughs) Venom, gotta go get him. But uh, now that the (laughs) jokes are out of the way... I kind of wanted to have like a more serious podcast today, if that's cool with you. Okay, yeah, fuck it. Okay... Um, so, over the last year, um, I have kind of, like, gone on, like, this mental health journey, and I feel like it's, it's been very beneficial to me, um, it's been very helpful, but, uh, I feel like I've never really, like, talked to people about it, like, I've talked to you about it, like, slightly, but I don't think a lot of people, like, know how my, like, brain works, and, like, this is something that my therapist told me to talk about, because... It's just a bit. It's a bit muggy, isn't it? You look. Uh, you look way shorter than me. Oh shit! <sighs> there we go. Co- now I'm the host. Why are you so co- big? <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's been something that I've been like, kind of exploring over the last years. My like mental health, and it all kind of like started with COVID. And I feel like that's something that it started with you as well. Where it's just like, I feel like isolation and the kind of being stuck with one's thoughts kind of makes it really hard to understand yourself until you actually like sit down and listen to those thoughts and like understand how crazy you sound and that's what happened to me personally where like I would spend like days just like sitting in my room being like oh shit like I I'm like crazy crazy but not like crazy crazy just like if you take it, it just divides into crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy, crazy divided by crazy, crazy. Oh, uh, it's just crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then there was a there was one day, like when I first moved in here. I think you probably remember this. I uh, I went to go help one of my friends pick up their car, and on the way back from picking up their car out of like the tow lot, like I forgot where I was and where I was going, what I was doing. And it was kind of like that moment for me where it kind of like clicked in for me and I was like, oh shit, like I really, I really need to get my shit together kind of thing. And it's been, it's been a very like hard journey, but I feel like I've begun to understand myself a little bit more Mm -hmm. and like try to take like the proper steps to kind of better myself. But within like understanding more about myself, I have kind of come to this realization, like, this is something that, like, actually, like, keeps me up at night, is that I, I finally got, like, diagnosed, like, I went to a psychiatrist, and I got my diagnosis of, like, what I have, and I got diagnosed with, like, bipolar disorder, ADHD, uh, borderline personality disorder, severe anxiety, and all of this, and it's, it's very much, like, a whole like martini mix of mental illness you know what i mean yeah it's shaken the, not it's, stirred it's the uh it's the jungle juice <laughs> the jungle juice of uh mental health yeah it's just like the vodka is like the bipolar disorder yeah, and, and then, it's like fireball <laughs> and that's like the severe anxiety yeah and then i'm just chugging it constantly yeah and like it's crazy to think it's crazy to think you're normal for so long like you're, it's crazy to think that the way that you've been living is what normal is to you and like you never know what normalcy feels like Mm -hmm. kind of thing because uh I've always thought that I was like normal quote unquote because like I just thought everybody deals with these problems and everybody kind of does in their own ways um I'm not the only one that has these problems kind of thing and um it it's been a kind of like this realization that I have all this stuff and like a root of a lot of, like a lot of these problems understanding that all of this is kind of like collided into like this kind of fear of 
losing that when I get on my medication because I'm about to get on medication on Friday. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's something that I've been, like, struggling with for, like, the last, like, ever since I got diagnosed. So you're worried that once you get on the meds, it'll kind of erase all the progress that you've gotten by yourself? I'm afraid that it's going to strip away what I deem as normal. Like, I have deemed that this, like, because this is all I know. I only know my severe anxiety where, like, anytime anybody says something, I... Overthink. I overthink. I... I kind of, I like I have a victim complex where it's just like anytime anybody says something I'm just like I I infer the worst kind of thing. I think the thing about that and you being worried about that is mm-hmm. you can't be worried to step out of your comfort zone cuz that's what you're trying to do. You're mm-hmm. trying to change. So you can't be afraid of change, but you just have to um you know, it's definitely going to be hard and it's going to be hard in a lot of different ways and you're definitely going to go through it a little bit, but you got to understand that that's what it takes to to better yourself and to get where you want to be. Mm-hmm. So I think that instead of going in with the mindset like, you know, oh this is going to be really hard, this is scary, this is different, you got to be like, well, it's different but kind of in an exciting way, mm-hmm. in like a progressive kind of way. And I think that that's the best way for you to go straight into it because I know that for me, um you said like COVID definitely was kind of It was an opportunity to sit with ourselves and just sit and think and figure ourselves out. But I knew way before then, like, you know, I had started kind of this journey of just like sitting by myself and asking myself questions and figuring out why I do the things I do or why I feel the way I do about certain things. Um, Yeah, so I think it's all about just like making sure that you continue to progress and understanding Mm -hmm. that relapses don't don't hinder your progress. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's not linear. Yeah. I don't know. I saw a tweet, like a meme (laughs) about it. And Uh and yeah, it's it's not linear. It's kind of all over the place. As long as you get to your final goal, the the journey doesn't, the the journey shouldn't be so intimidating. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely fair. But like my, my biggest fear with this like whole journey that I've been like going on is like, I guess I've heard a lot about just, like, bipolar disorder and these other things kind of being, like, the the seed of creativity kind of thing. Mm. And, like, I I feel like this medication that I'm about to go on is, like, I, I feel like it's going to make me, like, that normal SpongeBob, you know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm normal kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, like, can normalcy resides within the depths of creativity kind of thing? Like, can normalcy be within creativity like I feel like if I'm quote unquote normal and this medication like kind of like stops these like kind of intrusive thoughts that I have on a daily basis will it kind of strip away that creativity so I think that do a lot of artists and a lot of creatives deal with mental health issues yes I think that that's a pretty like across the board thing across pretty much all art But I think it's something where it's not the mental illness that's supplying the ideas. I think it's the mental illness that provides the experiences Mm -hmm. that give the ideas. You know what I mean? So it's not like, oh, my anxiety or like my intrusive thoughts gave me this idea. It's my experiences that I've had through my mental illnesses Mm -hmm. that have given me these creative ideas. So I think that even when you start feeling a little bit more balanced, you'll still like you should still go about understanding that those that creativity is still there because you've still had all those experiences to draw from Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's definitely true where like i feel like a lot of like see my my biggest problem is like i'm kind of like this is gonna sound so fucking pretentious and i'm sorry in advance to my entire (laughs) audience but i feel like like my creativity can be like a curse sometimes Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean where it's like I will have I will have these ideas and they will like kind of run through my brain for like days and days on end kind of thing and it, it won't escape me. And then as soon as I sit down and try to like write out like a script idea or like something like that, it just like vanishes like that. I definitely I have the same thing, but I think for me it's a little bit less. I mean, it definitely like van uh vanishes, mm-hmm. but I think that it's a little bit it's a lack of persistence, I think. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, once I hit an obstacle with an idea and I'm like, oh, I don't have this 100% thought out, I tend to leave it. Mm-hmm. And I think that 
you know, it might take a little bit of, like, a breakthrough where, like, you have to go through a little bit of writer's block or a little bit of, like, discombobulation to finally, like, break through and get to where you're trying to, like, go creatively. That's, that's how right. I've always felt. Yeah, and that's, that's it's definitely the case. But, it, see, for me, it's just, like, I, like, here's here's something that happened to me the other day. This is something I talked to my therapist about. Like, so there's this theater that I've been going to for, like, a long time called, like, Bowtie Cinemas. And the other day I went there, and, like, it was the last movie that I'm ever going to see there because they're selling their property. Mm -hmm. And I got, like, super emotional about it, like, walking out and, like, driving home. And, like, like this idea, like, came into my head where it was just, like, what if I just, like, made, like, a piece of, like, writing or just uh, a video or something that can, like, kind of encapsulate the feelings that I was feeling at that time and, like... It's just, it's just so hard for me to kind of like encapsulate my feelings because my feelings just go in so many different directions mm -hmm. and I internalize all of them. Like I try, I try not to be like an angry person because I like, I have a fear of losing people kind of thing. So I, I just refuse to like, in, like initiate conflict. And if I do, it's just like. It's just bursts of anger, and then I just get over it kind of thing. Yeah. And it's just, like, I I never know how to express my emotions in an elegant way kind of thing. I think that this, uh, getting on medication will be an opportunity for you to have a better time with that. Mm -hmm. Because I think right now with all the things that you're dealing with and all the things that you were diagnosed with... I think it does kind of pull your feelings and your thoughts all over the place. So it's really hard to collect all those and put them onto a page or put them onto a script or, you know, do whatever you want to do. But I think that um, when you're a little bit more balanced and you're on medication, you'll have the opportunity to still feel those feelings but have mm -hmm. a better chance of understanding them because they won't be all over the place and they'll be a little bit more tangible, I guess. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. See, that's that's the thing where it's just like you don't know how you're gonna react. Yeah, like, and that's what I, I'm so I like I'm so scared about it kind of thing. Like, it's definitely like I, I don't think that scary is the right word though. I think it's all about kind of your mentality about it, mm -hmm. and I feel like like I just feel like you should change kind of your mindset. Like, scary it, it's got a negative connotation, mm -hmm. so I think that you should go into it being like it's unpredictable yeah I think that that'd be a good word to use because unpredictable can be it can be bad but can, it, it can also be good that's true you know what I mean life is unpredictable that's that's very true but like I guess I guess I just reside in this kind of like I reside in a shell and you know this like mm -hmm. I reside I reside in my comfort zone and I don't take any steps out of that because kind of anything that makes me feel uncomfortable I I just, like, I freak out about, like, kind of thing. And it's just, like, mm -hmm. it's just, like, I I kind of, like, have to live by, like, monotony. Do you know what I mean? I have to have this kind of schedule where I do the same thing over and over again. And that can be maddening a lot of the time. Yeah. I but, think like, I you... feel like as soon as I stop, as soon as I stop that, like, I just, I, like, I, I freak out kind of thing. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, like... My my monotony right now is dwelling within my anxiety and, like, dwelling within, like, these kind of falsified narratives that I make up in my mind about, like, how people feel about me or, like, if I do this, will this person react this way? Like, when they said this, did that, like, mean that this kind of thing? And that's that's what I've always, like, relied on. It's, like, this weird, like, fucking slug defense mechanism where I just kind of, like, become this slime ball that's just, like... Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like a turtle in its shell. Yeah. I think... I, I can definitely see where you're coming from. I think that... You, how do I put this? Right. I think that you should be really grateful. Or, like, I, I think it's a really good thing that you went and got your diagnosis. Because now you know exactly what you have going on. Mm -hmm. And even when you showed me for the first time, like looking at it, I could tie it to other things that I've like noticed about you. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So the anxiety and things like that, I can be like, oh, I can see how that manifests in his actions. Mm -hmm. And I think that you get a chance to look at it that way too. Because I remember, um, you know, when I, when I first started 
having a little bit of like mental health stuff going on was in like high school mm -hmm. and I thought that I was depressed because I hadn't really learned much about anxiety mm -hmm. and I feel like it's kind of a failure within the system is not talking enough about mental illness and stuff like that because you can't have a real like uh, you can't have a real perception on what your emotions are mm -hmm. but so you know going to therapy and stuff when I was in high school and getting medicated when I was in high school like I thought I was depressed so like all these thoughts that I was telling was from more of like a I think I'm depressed perspective and it, it took me a while it took me for for somebody to tell me like hey you're really anxious mm -hmm. and then it just like all like it was like this big realization for me I was like oh that's the 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 root of all the things that bother yeah. me it's not that I'm particularly sad or depressed yeah. it's, it's it's that I'm constantly anxious see and that's that's the thing uh like about you that I've noticed, like, I remember, like, when I met you my freshman year, like, I thought you were, like, this ball of, like, charisma kind of thing. Like, nothing could, like, kind of stop you, uh, could stop you. And then, like, as I got to know you, I kind of saw, like, the cracks of anxiety where you have... You're like, oh, yeah. things can stop <laughs> this guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this guy yeah. is stopping <laughs> it's, def it's definitely this thing where it's just, like, I, like, I, like, I really look up to your, like, confidence and, like, how you carry yourself. I think it's, like, a really strong, like, attribute that you have. And, like, mm. I'm kind of jealous of it a lot of the time. But, um, like, and then, like, I can see how your anxiety kind of, like, drives your confidence a lot of the time. And that's not a negative thing. I don't think that's a negative thing whatsoever. But, like, it's weird how, like, my anxiety does, like, the polar opposite for yeah. me. Where it, like, my anxiety beats down my confidence constantly. Where it's just, like, your self-esteem going to be at an all-time low constantly. <laughs> for me, it definitely was like that for a long time. And I was really anxious. And I was really in my head all the time. And thinking about how people perceived me and all this stuff. And, and, and it does. It does beat down your confidence. And it does kind of make you live in a shell. And just, like, not want to see anybody. Because people have the opportunity to hurt you. Mm-hmm. You can't really, be, I mean, you can be hurt by your own thoughts, but it's, it's just different when you're alone. So, yeah, I guess I, I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's this weird, it's this weird, like, paradox, I guess you could say, where it's just like, I believe fully that I can, like, overcome these things. Mm -hmm. Like, That's I good. believe, yeah, I, like, I do believe that. That's a first But step. then I have, like, that nagging voice that's doubt. always in the... Yeah, doubt. I think, f for me, for better or worse, I, uh, you know, I've, d I've definitely gotten, like, arrogant and stuff like that. Like, I've definitely had people call me arrogant and mm -hmm. things like that. I think that my arrogance is kind of overcompensating for the feelings that you feel and mm -hmm. that I felt. I think it's a little bit, like... I'd rather feel like I'm the shit than mm. feel like I am shit kind <laughs> yeah, of thing. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I definitely think that that confidence and stuff comes from almost like a chip on my shoulder kind mm -hmm. of thing where I'm like, I felt put down by so many people for so long when I was a kid and I never felt like much. You know what I mean? And I always felt smaller. I always felt weaker. And it got to the point where, you know, you sit down with yourself and you find all these things that you like about yourself and you're like, I'm more valuable than I think I am. Yeah. And I, this is going to sound so pretentious to quote my own poetry, <laughs> but I wrote a poem and it's on the Instagram account at Caesar's Poetry. Um, but anyway, one of the lines is, um, it's, I know I am, I know I'm more than I think I am. And I think that that's just like an interesting thing to think about. Like, mm -hmm. it, it sounds kind of stupid, but you know that you are more than you think that you are. And I knew that I was more than I thought that I was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole young Caesar thing or whatever yeah. was really just like an opportunity for me to almost play a character that believes in themselves and likes themselves to a point where it's almost arrogant. But I'd rather be arrogant and love myself than insecure and hating myself. That's fair. See, like, I've tried, this is going to sound, this is sounds so stupid, but I've tried the whole, like, confidence thing before. Overrated. Yeah, overrated. Let confidence just, sucks. But, like, I feel like for me personally, I, like, when I tried to be confident, I was like, I'm trying to look for respect from people. But, like, yep. for me, I blurred the lines between respect and fear, mm -hmm. where I felt like the only people, the only way people would respect me is if they, like, 
feared me, quote unquote. Not like feared like in like a I'm gonna murder you kind of way, but just kind of like, oh, don't fuck with this kid kind of thing. Yeah, I think that that comes for me and for you, like in our past and like feeling smaller. Mm-hmm. It's nice to feel big. Yeah. You know what I mean? And sometimes, you know, you feel like you need to be big in order to get that, like, respect or that validation. Um, it, it takes a lot of work to realize that th- there's a balance, and I haven't quite found it yet. Yeah, I haven't quite found it yet. I don't know why I switched <laughs> to the British accent, but I can't take anything too seriously. It's like a Love Island fucking uh, interview booth right now. Yeah, it's kind of what I feel like. <laughs> Smugging, <Yeah>. mate. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... Like, like I said, like, I feel like this year I've, I've learned a lot about myself. Like, I've learned truly a lot. But, like, learning a lot about yourself is very scary. Definitely. Where, like, I will go back and, like, I'm sorry that this is so fucking depressing. I'm sorry. But, like, it, I feel like I've just been kind of, like, sitting on a lot of this stuff for so long. For sure. Like, these are the things that kind of, like, keep me up at night. And I was just like, might as well just share it to, like, all 40 people. All <laughs> Everybody that we know. Yeah. It was just like, I, learning about yourself is like a horrifying thing. Cause like, once you realize, like, you have the bullet points for each kind of like diagnosis kind of thing. Like, but once again, uh, and I'm sorry to cut you yeah. off, but I just want to like reinforce this. Like, I don't think that learning about yourself is really a scary thing. Mm-hmm. I think, like I said before, it's unpredictable. Yeah. But it's it's really important and it's something that it, it it's something that's important and it's something that's going to help you in the long run mm-hmm. so yeah. I, I guess i guess you could use the word scary but yeah. i just think that that's like a negative way to perceive it yeah like i guess the point that i was trying to get to yeah i apologize no 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 you're you're all good but like you what you said is true but like when you, like, I'll just read s- some of these off. Like, when when I got diagnosed with these things, I had my therapist and my psychiatrist kind of, like, give me these things that, like, what describes this disease. So, like, borderline personality, like, minor, th- minor threats are, like, a huge threat to me. Chaotic relationships, I have, like, a fear of, like, intimacy and these kind of things. I feel, like, empty all the time. That's, like, for borderline personality. For like ADHD, I am unable to con- <laughs> I'm unable to concentrate, <laughs> easily distracted, restless, impulsive, disorganized, which is wholeheartedly true. You're like you're like easily distracted. What's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it feels like. And then like uh, for like anxiety, it's just like everybody knows what anxiety is at this point. But like learning about these things, it was just like a lot of the things that like I learned through like actually reading about this are like a lot of the things people I wouldn't say people have problems with kind of thing but like what like how I see it is like a lot of these things is what I feel like people think makes me a burden because like I don't know if people actually think I'm a burden but like the voice in my head is constantly like oh like you did this so and they said this kind of thing and it's just like Oh shit! I left the I left the walk-in fridge door open again, and somebody said something. Ah, oh, fuck! I'm fucking up again, kind of thing. It's like those small things. It's just like those are the things that like people always. I'm not gonna say pick on me for, but like they'll joke around with, kind of thing. But then my brain just turns it into this kind of like downward spiral of just like self hate kind of thing and it's it's not it's not good it's not good whatsoever but it's just like it's how my brain works i don't know how to describe it it's really difficult because you know you're kind of told not to care what anybody thinks about you kind of thing mm-hmm. you know what i mean but we're both pretty empathetic people so it's kind of impossible not to care what other people think about the way that we Act. interact with them because we want them to you know we want to be a positive influence on their life and I don't think that that's a bad thing I think with all things that we've been talking about there's a balance right so it's a little bit like you know I want to do everything I can to make this person's life better easier but not when it comes like at a detriment to myself mm-hmm. so I don't want to over analyze what other people think about me because you know I, I, I don't want that to 
to lessen my own self-esteem and the way I see myself. But at the same time, you know, I want to come out, uh, come across as friendly and nice and, mm-hmm. you know, all those good things that you want to be. But, y- you know, I, th- I think it's important for you with the with the burden thing to kind of find a balance because, A, the people that you think that you're burdening aren't, and you know that deep down. But at the same time, who really cares? Yeah. Kind of thing. Like, but see, we're like, all your friends. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but I just want to finish my point. Like, we're all your friends, and you know that even if you are not like a burden, but like if somebody's doing something for you, mm-hmm. it's not. It, it's it's not going to be detrimental to your friendship. That's what friendships are. Friendships are. Yeah. It's mutualism. It's having somebody that you can lean on that can lean on you, and everybody that. You know, you I don't I don't want to say lean on in like a bad way, but everybody that you lean on in terms of just like you know a little bit of help here or there, like closing the walk-in fridge, you know something as mundane <laughs> yeah. as that, they know that they can lean on you too for whatever they need. Yeah, and like I like like I said, like deep down I know. See, this is this is the whole like kind of like contradiction that yeah. like happens in my brain. Like deep down I know that's that's true. So I, I kind of, like, have two roads where it's either I'm a burden to everybody else or I'm a burden to myself. And there's, like, no, like, in-between road. Is if I think, like, okay, like, deep down I know that they don't do this. I'm just kind of, like, creating this. I'm becoming a burden to myself. Mm-hmm. And if I follow the other road where I think, everybody, like, I'm affecting everybody else's life, I'm a burden to them kind of thing. And there is no kind of, like, there's no way for my brain to kind of, I guess just like separate them. Do you know what I mean? You, you you're like seeing it in black and white, and you can't see the yeah. Gray. And it's like people people can like see that's that's the biggest thing is like people can like say like you just got to do this, you just got to do that. It's just like and like I'll try. Like that's the biggest thing with therapy. Like I love my therapist very much, and like he gives me a lot of helpful advice, and a lot of it has helped. Like I've started journaling and like doing all of that, but like there's still this kind of and, like, the voice has gotten, like, the voices have gotten softer. <laughs> but, like, the, that Kill nagging... The Kill nagging them. <laughs> Killed them all. <laughs> the nagging voice has gotten softer, but it's still just, like... It's still, like, telling me, like, oh, yeah, you're fucking... Not, you're not going to get better from doing this kind yeah. of thing. And it's just, like... It's just, like... No matter what anybody says, like, I will try my goddamnedest. Like, I've been... I've been trying, like, so, like, yeah. hard, like, around this, like, apartment and just, like, trying to be more organized. But, like, there's still that, like, nagging voice that's always just, like, you could do more. Like, like I know you don't think this. Like, this is the thing. Like, I know deep down you don't think this. Mm-hmm. But there's, like, that thing where it's just, like, Christian's probably mad at me because I didn't do this. Yeah. And then, like, that'll run through my head for days on end. And then it's just, like, I'm afraid to bring up, like hey, did I fuck this up kind of thing? Because yeah. then I'm like, if I bring it up, he's going to, like, get mad at you, at, mad at me, even though I know you're not going to get mad at me, but, like, I still kind of convince myself that you're going to get mad at me. And it's just, like, this thing where, like, it just builds and builds. And then, it, like, it doesn't grow into resentment, but it kind of grows into this, like, like, I have to kind of create a barrier around myself where it's just, like, I, I feel like I personally have to, like, tiptoe around things because, like, I'm afraid that I created this whole story that that story is going to come true. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, it's a little bit like... Um, Self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's almost like if you like had something that you went to do and then you had this bad thought about it and then you don't go. Mm-hmm. It's basically like you're protecting yourself from what could happen. Yeah. This is going to sound really cliche, mm-hmm. but for me personally, kind of on my journey or whatever to try to better myself the 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 most important thing i think i've ever done is become friends with myself Mm -hmm. if that makes sense because like you've been saying like you kind of have this like inner voice like your conscience or whatever that kind of um that (laughs) that kind of uh it fucks with your thinking a little Mm -hmm. bit but i think the best thing that i've ever done is is gotten to a place where and this is going to sound so ridiculous, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it almost is like a Venom situation <laughs> where, like, I can sit and I can be like, well, was... why, why did we do this today? Like, uh-huh. why Why did, you know, and it's almost like having an inner inner monologue, but also a dialogue with yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that 
being able to talk to yourself and in, in understanding that you're both on the same path and yeah. like have the same goal and you both meaning like you and your conscience like mm-hmm. it, it just leads for like a smoother experience and you get more truthful answers from one another and I probably sound really crazy for like <laughs> acting like I have two voices in my head but I hope that's, that's how it is from. though like I feel like that's how it is with anxiety you have the rational voice and then you have the irrational voice it, then you have the irrational voice it's like a very like the left brain right brain situation is very accurate I feel like when it comes to anxiety where you have the rational thinking line and then you have the irrational thinking line and a lot of the time they just kind of merge where like your rational thoughts become rational thoughts you know what I mean yeah. where it's just like they your evolve. brain your brain is just like if you don't do this this will happen kind of thing and it's just like it's so hard to divide those kind of like it's like the ghostbusters like when the beams crossed <laughs> i used to have a really hard time um and this is a little bit different from your situation but just kind of finding a little bit of a tether um i used to have a really hard time in relationships where i would like trust the person but my anxiety would get in my head so much and like you said it's like the the realistic thinking the rational thinking and then the irrational thinking and the irrational thinking does a really good job of strongholding the rational yeah. hearing uh, i'm sorry thinking and um, so, yeah, I, I totally know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's just like, see, the one thing my therapist told me to do is like kind of like write, like when I start having irrational thoughts, like try to write those down kind of thing. Yeah. And like I started doing that and like they're not scary, but they're just like, holy shit. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Where it's just like you sound like a madman. <laughs> Like, I, I can read one if you want. I have some written down. But, like, uh, is the judgment I feel piercing my consciousness a reflection of my own sin- insecurities that project onto the walls of my mind like a film that has yet to be written? Or is this judgment a factual cornerstone that is found in all my relationships? Am I the child my friends see, or am I the child I see within myself? No matter No matter the solution, I am a burden to either my friends or myself. And, like, it's just, like, that's... That's how that kind of, like, irrational thought, like, those are the kind of things that they're, like, saying to me constantly. Yeah. Like, there is there is no bright side. And, like, people can, like, I don't want to, like, my kind of, like, parental figures are just, like, hey, like, look on the bright side. Just do this. Just do that. And it's just, like, it's not, it's not that easy. You can't I, just, like, look on the bright side. I think that for people that are a bit more neuronormal or haven't been through some of the things that are, like, you know, don't experience the same mental things that you, mm-hmm. you go through, I think it, it's difficult for them to wrap their head around what you're feeling. So somebody that has never felt anything like that, they're like, well, you just you just be happier you know yeah. what I mean be less anxious worry less like my my parents always tell me that my mom's a little bit more understanding but my dad is very much like why are you anxious all the time mm-hmm. and I'm like I, I don't know how to explain it to you because you've never really experienced anxiety mm-hmm. like this so how can I really like properly express it and I think that that's why I kind of I've, and I've always felt this I think that your parents are a little bit not dismissive but they just don't understand yeah where you're coming from enough enough to help you sometimes and they like, my parents have really, I feel like they've kind of, like, put effort towards trying to, like, understand, but it's, there's still, like, this disconnect. Like, my dad has been very supportive kind of thing, but my mom, there's, like, this huge, huge disconnect. She was, like, a fucking cheerleader, popular kind of person, and it's just, like, she'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm here for your mental health kind of thing. Like, whenever you are in trouble or you feel sad, just, like, talk to me, and then, like, when it comes to that moment, it's just, like, well, just just try to be happy. Try to think of the positive things in your life. And it's just like, Mom, like, I don't know what you want me to do, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really weird case because it's very frustrating mm-hmm. when somebody says something like that to you because you're like, you don't understand where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think that to a certain extent, all you can really ask of someone is to try. Yeah. And I do think that it's a really positive thing that your parents are trying for you to kind of better understand your mental health or be there for you and I know that they may not be the best at it but I do think that you know you should take their their and that's that's what I've been like trying to do it's just like take their kind of t- 
take their help with uh, non, not sadistic, what am I looking for? Like rose-colored glasses kind yeah. of thing. Just be like, they're coming from the right place. They're trying their goddamn best. It's like the, um, it's like in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. It's like, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. He's got the spirit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's, yeah. That's, how, that's how I've like started like rationalizing, like when, like, especially when my mom tries to help, where it's just like, this is the only thing she knows kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's just like, I, I'm not going to get mad at her. Yeah. It's just like... And you can't get resent, uh, resentful over that either because she's trying. Yeah. That's all you can ask. Yeah. And it's just like, one day, I guess like, like I've tried to, like I've tried to explain it to my parents before, but I feel like I just scared them more kind of thing. Because mm-hmm. like, I, I sat down with them one day and I was just like, the way that my brain works is it's tr- constantly trying to kill me. And that's what I told them. And they just kind of, like, started freaking out. And I was like, I probably should have come out with, like, a better way to explain that. Yeah. But that's how it feels. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the only way you can kind of explain it. Mm. Where it's just, like, it's not, like, constantly trying to, like, kill me personally, but just kind of, like, self-sabotage. Self-sabotage. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that that's why, again, it kind of comes back to the finding a way to, to coexist. Mm-hmm. with that inner inner voice and inner thoughts and just be like, how can I take these inner thoughts in this way that I think and turn it into something positive and progress? Mm-hmm. And I know that it can be difficult when those thoughts are so intrusive, but it, it's something where, like, we are the way that we are, and mm-hmm. to a certain extent we can't really change that, so we have to take what we are and who we are and, you know, what mental illnesses we may have we have to kind of roll with them and we have to figure out a way to twist it and make it into a better situation, whether that's through medicine or meditation or, you know, just sitting and having conversations with yourself. So I think that that's a really important part of kind of the mental health journey is, is really sitting down and being like, you and I, me and my inner intrusive thoughts have me to and kind you of seize it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever you may call it. Like we need to sit and we need to work together and we need to we need to really figure it out. And you really need to it's almost like rehab. You yeah. know what I mean? You need to go into rehab with the intention of getting out clean. Mm-hmm. You have to go into the self help journey with the total intention of and and confidence, I guess, that you can do it and that you'll make it out on the other side. Yeah. And like that's that's what I've started to realize now is like, I've I've started to notice small t- like small like steps where it's just like, I I am being more open with my thoughts kind of thing. Or like I, like a lot of the time if I have a problem with something I'll just kind of, not say anything. And like I've kind of like I still haven't fully, but like I've kind of started taking steps where it's just like, I don't know if it's sticking up for myself, but just kind of like presenting my my morals and like my moral compass and just like if something like offends me or I don't like how someone speaks about something I'm going to say it because like I feel like I just kind of like sit so silently a lot I, like I used to sit so silently about a lot of these issues yep and it's just like I guess it's just like uh, I don't okay I guess I'll come out here. Um, You're like, coming out. Yeah, I'm coming out. Um, so over the last year, I've I've understood a lot about like my gender identity kind mm-hmm. of thing, and like Christian knows this, but like a lot of our friends that don't listen to this podcast don't know this, but like I've I've discovered a lot about my gender identity, and like I might have been. Assigned um, male at birth, but like there's this there's there's two sides to me kind mm-hmm. of thing. I have I have this masculine energy, but I very much have this very feminine energy as well. And most people probably notice it's probably not a big surprise to a lot of people. People are like, women's <laughs> feminine. <laughs> Since when? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, I've I've realized that I'm like I'm non-binary, and like I use pronouns like. Like, I dabbled in, like, he, they, but it just didn't feel right for, like, a lot of the time. And, like, with, like, Lou and you using, like, my proper pronouns with, like, they, them kind of thing, it makes me, like, every time it does, like, I feel kind of, like, I feel good about it kind of thing. That's good. And, like, I guess, like, another step to kind of, like, understand, like, 
standing up for myself is just kind of like correcting more people and letting people know more about this Definitely. where it's just like I would like to be referred as they them and I know it's going to be hard for a lot of people and like I'm not going to like bite your head off if you call me he him or that kind of thing so you prefer they them over like he there yeah okay yeah it's it's something that I've realized recently like because like like I said I I actually like feel something when yeah. like somebody calls me like they them now. Like I feel I feel kind of like welcomed. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really good to know because you know when Lou and I would talk, and I thought that it was he they like mm-hmm. I would say they them sometimes, but then other times I would try to say he him just to kind of like, you know, keep that. I I didn't want that to get lost in a fold, but it, but it's good to know that you know you you feel a lot better when it's they them. Yeah, it, it, and like like I said. I don't expect this to be something that just happens overnight where everybody's just like, oh, they, them. Because I know people are still going to perceive me as a male. And that's, like, the biggest thing with, like, coming out as non-binary and finding finding your true self kind of thing. It's just, like, you are going to be perceived a certain way because... The way that you present yourself, mm-hmm. it's really hard for people to see past that, yeah. I think. And and that's diffi- that's been difficult for me as well. Yeah. It's, like, I try, like... I guess I don't dress feminine kind of thing, but, like, I try to, like, play with gender norms when I, like, dress kind mm-hmm. of thing. Like, I'm not afraid of being flamboyant. Definitely not. Um, and, like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you, you look sus today kind of thing. And, like, I don't, I'm not offended by that, but it's just like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I was going for kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's just like, I don't mean to, like, come at you, my manager, but, like... Last podcast, he was like, "Oh, you like last podcast? You look like a sixteen-year-old lesbian." And I was like, "That, <laughs> that's what I was going that's for." Kind of what I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's, it, it, it's kind of like, "Oh, you look sus today," and it's like, that, "That's take a compliment." The hint. Take the hint. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. That's awesome, man. I'm really, I'm really happy that you know you feel comfortable enough yeah. to everybody that listens that that you can, um, that you can kind of come out to them that way. Like, yeah, like. Like I'm not I'm I'm not scared kind of thing, but it it was kind of that thing where it's just like I still don't know how people are gonna take it kind of thing. Like I don't know how like our friends are gonna take it, but like I I feel like I know deep down that like our friends and like the friends that I've met through you actually like truly cared about, care about me now. Definitely. Which I struggled with for a long time, where it's just like oh do they just see me as like Christian's friend kind of thing. But I now, think they see me as Landon's friend now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just like I, I I truly feel comfortable that they're gonna like support me and like I I don't really have like I don't have any like doubts kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's really good. There's my truth, bitches. I think that to a certain extent it kinda and and obviously, you know, you want and I and I hope that our our friends and people that listen do kind of focus on working on your pronouns and the way that they see you and everything like that. But I think to a certain extent, it's it's not really about how other people perceive you necessarily. It's about the fact that you have said it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you've you just said that you feel confident, and you feel comfortable enough to come out that way. Mm-hmm. And I I think that. You know, even if nothing comes of this and nobody ever talks to you about it, at least you know, like, I, you know, I... I put that message out. Yeah, I put like, that message out and I did right by myself. Yeah. And I think that that's important for you. Yeah, and I feel like the biggest thing is just, like, this sounds like I'm blackmailing you guys, but it's just, like... I swear to God, I swear don't to say God, God you don't do it. Um, but it feels like, like, every time somebody refers to me as they, them, I kind of get, like, that confidence boost. That's awesome. Like, or if somebody says that I look sus today, I kind of get a confidence boost. Like, it might, I don't think people mean it in, like, a derogatory way, but it's just, like, it kind of boosts my confidence a little bit. I'm not going to front. Um, but, yeah, like, I guess if you want me to get better and healthier, refer to me as they, them. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, <laughs> This is a warning. Deliver the girl <laughs> to 11401 <laughs> West Point Parkway. But yeah, um, so yeah. Yeah, congratulations, man. Feels good. That's awesome. What do you want to talk about now? I mean, <laughs> porn. <laughs> I guess we should like talk about user reviews. What? About like what people said about uh, our last episode. 
I feel like our last episode was the most... It's, it's so weird that we went from, like, talking about, like, masturbation and, like, fucking cornflakes last episode. And now we're talking about, like, these deep kind of, like, intrinsic kind of things. We're dynamic, man. We are dynamic. We got a dynamic podcast. But, yeah, I think a lot of people liked our last podcast. And now we're switching it up on them. Yeah, everybody's going to be like, I hate it. <laughs> this episode. They're not this even going to make it to the part where I come out. No. Gonna, they're going to be like... They've just been talking about anxiety for thirty minutes. And they're gonna like, they're gonna point at you and they're gonna be like, his podcast sucks. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, um, we we got we got one piece of user feedback where um, we need to. Uh, they said we need to stop talking about porn. Yeah, they and said that the they said that the porn was they said that the porn was too much too yeah. much porn. We talk too much about porn. And I guess I guess they I guess they're on to something kind of thing, but like it's just so easy to fall back on. Also, it's, everything comes back to porn. Yeah, it's just it's like this very kind of like circular movement, where it's just like you start a conversation about masturbation, it's going to end up to porn. Like there's no there's no roundabout way, especially with us. Yeah, like pff, we beat it every once in a while. What can we say? <laughs> also, uh, it's it's hard to talk for an hour straight. Every week. Yeah, it's exactly. Difficult. And sometimes you got to go off the rails a little bit. You got to yeah. talk about porn. It's true. But so, <laughs> this episode, we will not talk about porn because uh, we take criticism. Well, yeah. But we're not going to promise, like, next episode we won't talk about Next porn. episode's going to be the porn episode. Yeah. Exclusive. We'll, we'll title it uh, Fuck You. Fuck You, Edwin. Yeah, Fuck You, fuck Edwin. You, Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> That's fuck You, it's... Edwin. We love porn. <laughs> and it's just going to be, like, a bunch of hypotheticals. He's like, you guys should tell more personal stories. We're going to be like, no, fuck that. We're talking about porn and hypotheticals. That's all next episode is going to be. I, I, I'm trying to think of a funny story having to do with my anxiety to tell. Because we did get the note that we should tell more stories. About why not? anxiety? Just in general. Tie it into the theme of the episode. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, I have a weird bathroom anxiety. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and your piss anxiety as well. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I uh, thought you meant, like, the locking the door kind of thing. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Um, so... When, when I was a freshman in college, I had this girlfriend that slept in this twin bunk with me, super high up, and we used to get drunk and do a bunch of drugs and stay out all night, and one night, I pissed the bed with her in it, and I, I woke up and just, like, covered, I, well, I remember the dream, I was taking a piss in the dream, and uh-huh. then I woke up, and I was soaked, and I was like, what the fuck, and I was like, can I make... Can I make this, like, on her and be like, hey, babe, you pissed the bed? And I was like, no, nah, can't do that. So I had to wake her up in a puddle of my piss and uh, and be like, hey. I, hey. Hey, good morning, sweetheart. Uh, I pissed the bed. You got to get the fuck up and give me all your clothes and get naked hey, in this room with two other dudes that are sleeping right now. And I got to sl- sneak my little piss blankets out of here. Pay and, uh, 50 cents pay to wash them. Pay 50 cents to wash them. But um, so now... Like, if I have to piss even a little bit before bed, I can't sleep. Like, I got to go piss right before bed. Like, yeah, or it, like, really freaks me out. And if I ever pee in a dream, bro, I wake up immediately, and I'm like, <gasps> and then I'll be dry, and I'll be like, <laughs> and I, just, I feel like a toddler. Like, I get excited when I don't piss the bed. Really? Like, yeah. <laughs> You're just like, oh, I, I made it through the night. I'm like, little <laughs> week straight. <laughs> You have, like, that's what you hide in, like, when you post your poetry, you have, like, you have to, like, crop out, like, the countdown <laughs> thing, where it's, like, 12 days without pissing the bed. It goes back to zero, I'm like, fuck. This makes it sound like I piss the bed really often. I don't. It's it's not, like, a very recurring thing, but... When was I, the last time you pissed the bed? Uh, not that long ago. Tyler was living here. <laughs> Jesus Yeah, Christ. I had a, uh, I had, like, an egg crate, like, mm-hmm. one of those foam mattress things, and it was really nice, and I pissed all over it, and I had to get rid of it. Jesus. But it didn't soak into the bed, so word. Also, Tyler, I never told you about that. Jesus. <laughs> you should tell him about, like, because I think this is hilarious. Like, when you take showers and, like, you have to lock the door kind of thing. Oh, I think that that's reasonable. Uh, lock. <laughs> I have to lock the... I have to lock the door to the apartment and the door to the bathroom. But the door to the apartment is, like, I get really worried that somebody's going to steal Drax. 
I don't know why, but he like sits in the window, and I just have this like strange like strange like anxiety that someone's just like looking up and they're like oh, the perfect cat i can't wait to go take it i don't know why they fucking sound like that like, oh that cat looks like garfield i bet you he hates mondays, he hates and mondays and lasagna. And lasagna. <laughs> but yeah so that i think that that's the main reason why i locked the door to the apartment because i'm like i'd be so pissed if i came out and like we just didn't have drax anymore because somebody fucking took my cat you said something about the tv once too where you're like how shitty would it be if you just walked oh out of the bathroom? I'd feel like a dumbass if I just, like, showered through a whole-ass heist. Like, my bed's gone and shit. The fridge is Everything, missing. everything is gone. Everything. It's just barren. And the only thing that's standing is the little, uh, the little, uh, Jimmy Carter picture that we have in the living room. Like, who the fuck? Why do they have a picture of a peanut farmer? Up? <laughs> but Jimmy Carter, the peanut farmer. I feel like... I don't really have a lot of funny stories with my anxiety. I feel you. Where it's just, like, a lot of it's just kind of sad. But, like, the only times that my, like, anxiety gets to, like, a weird kind of, like, this is, you're freaking out about nothing kind of thing is when I, like, smoke too much. Yeah. Where, like, there, the, uh, I forget, you went on a trip with your parents mm. one weekend. And I was like, I'm going, I'm going to, like, I'm just going to get fucking blitzed kind of thing in my room by myself. I got fucking, I got higher than I've ever gotten. And I, like, I was sitting there, and I was like, is the front door unlocked? I went, checked, and I was like, okay, it's locked. Went sat back down, and I was like, wait, is was the, the front door the locked? the front door locked or unlocked? And then I went back, checked, and I was like, holy shit. Like, our front door just, like, opens sometimes when it's, like, unlocked. Um, and I was like, what if it, like, opens and, like, Drax runs out? So I... <laughs> So I opened the door, locked it, and I convinced myself that Drax got out. And I was, like, looking through, like, that hallway and, like, the stairs. I was, like, looking for Drax. Our neighbors were like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? I was, like, blitzed out of my mind. I was like, Christian's going to be fucking pissed if he comes back home and Drax is missing. And I'm just, like, <laughs> combing the stairs for, like, looking for Drax. And I'm like, oh, shit, I lost Drax. I convinced myself I lost Drax. I opened the door. Drax is sitting at the top of his kitty tower. And I'm like, oh, my God. My life is saved, finally. <laughs> Bro, you ever, you ever be high and get so anxious and you sit there and you feel your heart beating? And I'm yeah. like... Is this like, a heart attack? Am I yeah. dying? <laughs> yes. Is this what dying feels like? That was that was what happened. I feel like most people know this story already, but like the other night, you you text no. I heard a knocking on the door. And I was I like I need to smoke to go to sleep kind of thing cuz like if I don't like mind race kind of thing. And like I was having sometimes the weed works for me, sometimes it doesn't. It kind of like heightens my anxiety sometimes. And that's when it hyped my anxiety the other night. And, like, I get a text from Christian. He's like, hey, yo, are you, like, in the bathroom? The door is locked. I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, the door is locked. So I come out there, manual breathing. Uh, my breathing was not on autopilot. Where I, I, was just, uh, where I was just like. <sighs> Bro, have you ever seen the thing where it's like, this is what. Navy steels do when they need to relax and it's like a square and like when it goes across you're supposed to like inhale mm -hmm. and then hold and then exhale and hold I'd be thinking about that when I'm really high <laughs> and I'm <be> like <sighs> when I just like see a little box going around in my head <laughs> I, I've i never done that but now I'm gonna like think about that it the really helps to be smoke. honest really? with you yeah it really does it helps with my anxiety a lot Damn, I might do that then. If the Navy SEALs can do it, then so can I. If I can fucking unscrew a doorknob, blitzed out of my mind, I can breathe in a box or whatever you just said. Yeah, bro, you can breathe in a box. Uh, oh, shit, what was, what was I going to say? With the breathing thing. Um, I The other night, too, when I got high, I was like, I'm going to try self, like guided meditation. So I like turned on guided meditation. It was like to find your, like, spirit guide kind of thing yep. where like helps you find like what your spirit guide is got really high like like the breathing thing like helped me where i was like breathe in breathe out relax your toes move up your body and i like felt everything relaxing and i was like i was feeling good and then it was like you see your soul kind of like getting deeper and deeper within inside your body and you're going with your soul and you're about to see your spirit guide and like the spirit guide i envisioned was um the Pillsbury Doughboy. 
And I don't know if that's my actual spirit guide or I was just really fucking hot. Bro, I don't think it's a, I don't think that's a bad thing for that to be your spirit guide. I can't lie to you. I just I, I just remember like because they were like they they envisioned it in this like tree. So like you walk into this tree, like it has like a little door. You walk in this tree and like they say that your spirit guide is just like sitting there. So I vision this tree, I walk in, and it's just the fucking Pillsbury Doughboy. You touch him and he's just like, like, oh! (laughs) No, but like the thing was, he didn't have the Pillsbury Doughboy voice. He had my voice. And I was like, am I the Pillsbury Doughboy? (laughs) Maybe that's the secret to unlocking everything that's going on with you. Yeah, it's just like, maybe maybe if I like fully commit to being the Pillsbury Doughboy, I will feel completely comfortable in my own skin. You can't. You gotta change your. Uh, you gotta change your pronouns again, bro. To Pillsbury and Doughboy. Doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> that Doughboy over there. But yeah, like I, I was like, holy shit, I want fucking croissants. I want Pillsbury and Doughboy croissants, and then I passed out. But I. <laughs> <laughs> That's what your spirit guy was trying to tell you. Yeah, but no, I, like my spirit guy was like, yeah, it was actually kind of helpful. Like I've never done like. S- not self-guided, but, like, guided meditation before where, like... Because, like, I've never been able to focus, but, like, that night I was able to, like, actually focus and envision shit. And, like, it helped me with my anxiety in a lot where it was just, like... Like we were talking about earlier, I was able to, like, kind of, like, the Pillsbury Doughboy was my inner voice kind yeah. of thing. And I was able to, like, sit down at this little, like, wooden table in front of this tree, in this tree, and I was like... This sounds like I was tripping, but I wasn't tripping. I, where, I, <laughs> I was meditating. Kind I see of where you're coming from. I think that I'm at the point in my kind of mental health stuff where, you know, I understand myself pretty well and I got a pretty decent uh, hold on my anxiety without medication or anything like that. So I think that I want to kind of take it to a more spiritual level Mm -hmm. and just have a better, like, kind of progress towards peace kind of thing because ultimately I think that that's what I'm striving for and I think that that's probably what most people are striving for. It's just, like, peace and contentness. And, uh, yeah, I just, I think that, meditating has always been really hard for me too. I get mm-hmm. distracted really easily, but um, I think that that's probably the next big step that I need to take is start meditating and kind of having a better understanding of, of, a, of a more spiritual reality. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I, this is going to sound like I just kind of like didn't listen to a thing you just said, but like, I feel like you should just get like really high to the point where you have anxiety kind of thing. And mm-hmm. then like do one of those guided meditations. Cause then you can start to like, those loud, like, nagging voices kind yeah. of thing. You can slowly start, like, as you're focusing on the meditation, you can, like, slowly start to feel those kind of, like, soften kind well, of thing. Well, the strangest thing with my anxiety is I think because I've thought about it so much and I have, you know, a pretty good a pretty good hold of, like, being able to get those thoughts away, mm-hmm. uh, usually it's just a body anxiety for me. And I get, yeah. like, the heart races and, you know, all that stuff. But most of the time it's not really thoughts. It's more of, like anxious body stuff that's yeah. why I move my legs so much yeah I definitely feel that I have like I, I mean have, I appreciate what you're saying yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like I'm like fuck you I don't have thoughts I yeah. have no thoughts anymore no thought only body I, if I fucking did the self or the guided meditation tour I'd imagine the Kool-Aid man I'd imagine uh, Chester Cheetah fucking my wife <laughs> <laughs> call that Oh my god. Can you imagine you walk into this tree? <laughs> it's just Chester the Cheetah fucking Lou. Really, my girlfriend. I'm like, I don't really know why I came here. He's like, sit down. I'm like, I don't really want to. He's like, sit down. down. Yeah, you're just like sitting there. You're having like your body anxiety where you're like, oh shit, sorry. You're like, why socks feel so tight against feet? Why can toes not move independently? <laughs> They're just like, oh, God, Chester the Cheetah, stop, please. I can't feel my toe. Damn it, now if I'm ever going to do one of these guided meditations, I'm definitely going to see Chester Cheetah. See, the reason I, like, did it is because this is going to sound stupid as well. I was on TikTok, and somebody, like, made a video about the, like, guided meditation. And when they did it, they imagined that Gary from that episode of Spongebob where he's in, like, the trench coat and he's in the yeah. big library. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if I could get Gary. And, like, I did it, and I just got the Pillsbury, uh, Pillsbury fucking Doughboy. The, I think the Pillsbury Doughboy is a good one. I think that's fun. I, I think that my anxiety would be <laughs> gone if I could talk to the Pillsbury Doughboy. With your voice? Yeah, I think he's a douchebag, but <laughs> <laughs> it'd be fun. <laughs> he'd it's be like, like, hey, man, what's going on? What's up, boss? That's what he'd say. <laughs> what's going on, boss? 
<laughs> You'd be like, huh, nothing much. How's it going? <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm doing well. <laughs> doing well. <laughs> Fucking bitches getting money. I'm like, hey, young Caesar baby. Do you, you think, do baby. you think the Pillsbury Doughboy would be young Caesar? Or do you think it would be Christian? Do you think you'd be young Caesar? Or do you think you'd be Christian? See, that's the thing, bro. We fused into one. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. That's See? fair. They're, they're not separate entities. It's just being able to talk with my inner self, which is still me. So, in conclusion, <laughs> young Caesar, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like we're about to forget something. We're coming up on the hour mark. We actually are exactly at the hour mark. That's crazy. Yeah. But um, I feel like we owe somebody an apology. Yeah, we do. I don't remember what we're apologizing for, but um, I do we, apologize. Last episode, we said uh, Charles Brown had a porn addiction. And we needed to get him uh, cornflakes. He didn't even. Uh, he didn't even. He didn't even mention it. Up. But like, I feel like we still kind of have to apologize for it. Yeah, we have thing. to. Yeah, for sure. Because I think if we just let it sit there, he's gonna like grow resentment, kind of thing. Like yeah. he might get anxiety, and like we just kind of want to settle, settle the air, kind of thing. So Charles Brown, we sincerely apologize for saying you have a porn addiction. Um, we know that not to be true. We know that not to be true, but. Um, I think you really need to work on uh, your porn addiction. <laughs> no, not your porn addiction. I think you need to work on your uh, NBA uh, 2K addiction. Because, mm-hmm. like, I think that you keep trying to get better. And, like, I really I really respect that. And I think it's, like, really great that you do that. Well, and it kind of ties into the mental health thing. Yeah. Right? You're always trying to get better. But, um... The definition of insanity, Charles, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I feel like you're kind of like starting to fall into that when it comes to 2K. And we're here for you. Um, and I'm sorry if this offends you, but like if it does, just let us know. We'll apologize for it on the next episode. Um, but yeah, we, we really need to help you with your 2K uh, a- addiction. Um, but yeah, that's it. Well, thank you guys for coming uh, to the coat closet today. Uh, this was our eighth episode, so uh, we really two months. Two, oh, t- this is our second episode. <laughs> this is our eighth Whoa, episode. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate you guys all uh, for listening. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter uh, at the coat closet, mm-hmm. YouTube. If you're listening on Spotify, it's going to be on YouTube, the coat closet, all the normal plug stuff. Uh, Caesar's poetry on Instagram. If you know, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, we, we, we appreciate it a whole lot. We appreciate mm-hmm. you listening to us. And if you guys ever need anything or ever feel, you know. Don't be it, afraid to talk to us. Don't be afraid to talk to us. Because I'm always there for you. And it'll finally give us some, uh, some, some traffic in our Twitter DMs. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to tell us all the things that you yeah. need to tell somebody. There's four RSS subscribers that we have. I know one of them has to be dealing with some stuff. So. Tell us your issues. Please. We want to help. The first, okay. The first RSS person to follow us on Twitter, we will virtually invite you to a segment on the podcast. We'll do, we'll do an interview. Yeah, we'll do we'll, an interview, we'll interview, and then we'll edit it into the podcast. Yeah. Just so, so it's not live. Yeah. That's that's your uh, incentive. So please follow us on Twitter um, so you can be a part of the coat closet. We'd love to have you. All right, guys. Have a good night. Stay safe. Good night.